So, wow, that's uh, a really, really beautiful, incredible movie. I Watching it again, I, it's really good. Man. Thank you. It's really, really I good. I actually liked it, too. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I, this movie was made in, what, 1971 and a half? So that's, that's almost 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not and, much. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a long and probably boring story about the, the evolution of it, but uh, it got made, I won't tell you all the background to it, but we made it and we got a company to distribute it, but because they didn't really think that it would necessarily find an audience, so they didn't put a lot of marketing behind it, because this was right at the same time uh, in the era of what they used to call black exploitation films. Shaft, Superfly, Foxy Brown, Coffee, Slaughter. And the, the movie industry finally discovered that there was like, a black audience and they were just making all these films to try and capitalize on that. But they wanted them all to be kind of tough, cool, uh, fair, fair amount of action, violence, whatever. And along we come with a movie that is supposed to make people feel good and little kids can watch and they didn't think there was an audience for that so they opened it for like a couple of weeks and then it just evaporated. So I haven't had much contact with it over the years since that happened and I haven't watched it and I really liked it. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I, got a, I got a little choked up a couple of times just to know because it really was true for, for I mean, I, this is, we're in Texas now so maybe people grew up aware of rodeo and aware of that there were black cowboys, but in New York, I don't know if you could just tell when the guys were in the street in that parade and the people were all in awe, hanging out the windows and seeing this. They really, it was the first time they knew that this existed. And they all probably had been exposed to Roy Rogers. Like that. That's why I opened the film that way. All these kind of what seemed like dorky cowboys uh, even though they were very famous, Hopalong Cassidy and Gene Autry. Uh, but there was nobody for the black audience to identify with, but they still went to the movies and saw westerns. But nobody, literally, I mean, I, it's hard to say this without feeling like I'm parroting the song, but nobody ever told them they were black cowboys. And Sammy Turner wrote that song to use as part of the rodeo itself, and we re-recorded it and used it in the film. That's, that's such a great message. And, for, and just to watch all the people experiencing this, it was really gratifying. I was kind of, even though we made this movie and never got any money back from it, but the feeling I have right now in my stomach is it's worth it because just seeing those people reacting like that. Yeah, yeah. I okay. I, I tend to talk too long. No, no, that was, that was a good answer. And I'm going to ask you some more. I just want to make sure we get to everybody and also get to a couple of audience questions. So, Freddie, you were there. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you're next. I just like impressions. What do you? What do you? What were your thoughts when you were watching this? You were actually there. You know, can you share with us what you what you think um, after watching this film? What your thoughts are, and and also why? Can you tell us why you went by Ski Richardson at the time? Why you use a different name? Well, uh, I was in the professional rodeo cowboy association, so we didn't supposed to make amateur rodeos. So I would be someone else when I go to the amateur road. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had been back in New York from 56 to 59 at the old Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of familiar with New York, mm -hmm. but that's the first time I went down in Harlem with a mm -hmm. rodeo. That, mm -hmm. that was something mm -hmm. I really ate and enjoyed. What was it like? What was that experience that was, like? That was wild. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, they never saw a rodeo yeah. before. But, but it's a lot of, you know, Black cowboys down this part of the country, but not up in the eastern part. Mm -hmm. But I, I love to go there because I want to go to New York. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I really, you know, have the same questions for everybody else. I mean, this is, is this the first time that, like, Kushia Brie, that you, have all, have all of you seen this? Like, yeah, okay, you had, I, Kushia, have you seen this film before? Had you seen it before? Lucretia. Oh, have I seen it? Yeah. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah, and it, had you seen it before time. or no? <laughs> no, you? No, yes, I saw it before. Oh, you did see it before? That's right. When, when had you seen it before? Oh, I guess it was about a year after it was, after the, it was produced. I saw it in Houston. And I think that was one. Hey, we went there twice. Right. To see. Okay. 
I think that was the one. Okay. Sammy, had you had you seen it before? No, I hadn't. It's the first time I've seen it. So what, yeah, so y'all, if you could just share, like, what your impressions are. I mean, and anything you can share with us based on your expertise, your literacy, anything that we, we should know. There may be some people that, obviously, you knew in the film, some, some things that we, you know, should be shared with us that you could educate us about. Um, this is your world. This is, you know something you know so much about. And I, I really just want to know what you think, you know, what you thought about it when you were watching it. Well, um, I knew a lot of the people that was in the rodeo. And because uh, uh, I came behind most of them. And at the time, I was, uh, you know, just getting out of high school, you know. And, but then I came back out of the service and I rodeo with them. Mm -hmm. So I knew most of the guys that was on that film. Mm. And what, what do you think about the film, Black Rain? I think they done great. Yeah. <laughs> it was really nice. And that was the first time I've seen it, and I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Kushia, what, what are your thoughts? I think the movie is very interesting and very educational. It's a very good learning experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's good to see our young, well, as you see now, the young people, the young black people nowadays mm -hmm. don't know anything about the black rodeos, don't know anything about rodeos, don't know anything about riding a horse. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are afraid. Mm -hmm. But I have to, I want to encourage them, don't be afraid. You know, just, just try it. You'll love it. It is a fun sport. Mm -hmm. And it, it depicted, I mean, what did you think about the depiction of, uh, the barrel riders and the women that are doing what you do, what you've done in the film, because there was a section that I've done. Yeah. It, to me, I started out as a, a young adult in the, um, and I youth rodeos, mm. and it was a good experience for me. I grew up on the ranch mm -hmm. with my dad mm -hmm. and my brothers mm -hmm. <laughs> at my back. So that's why I wasn't really afraid. And I, one thing about it, um, you're going to have some bumps and bruises. You're going to fall. That ground is hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm a witness to that. But the main thing is don't be afraid. Just dust yourself off and get up and try it again. Amen. So, so Bree, we're going to get you on a horse now. <laughs> so, Bree, what, what, I mean, Bree, you have. Bree has like, I don't even, it's so phenomenal what she's done. I, I don't even, it's like hard to even articulate. I mean, she's created this whole cultural moment and movement. She's been interviewed by everybody under the sun. Soon, you know, Martians are gonna, from Mars are gonna reach out to you and ask you to tell us about the Yeehaw agenda. And I mean, you, you coined this idea and tapped into this whole kind of zeitgeist moment that really has come to the fore. And then here we have this movie from you know almost 50 you know years ago that is capturing a lot of the same ideas and uh, yeah. yeah passion points that I think you are really representing in your aesthetics and all the beautiful imagery that you've been sharing on the internet and on so I really want to know what you think about the film and I thought that was amazing and I feel honored to be on stage with these people because me too. When I came up with that phrase, when I coined it, it, I had no idea like it would be the name of this movement or whatever. I was just, you know, one of my friends here, one of my followers. I was, we all, always talk like that. We always say random stuff like that. And it was a play on the gay agenda. Like, you know how everybody right. says, it's the gay agenda, it's the gay agenda. Like, you know, yeah. uh, they're pushing it. So I was like, oh, this is the e agenda. <coughs> no one really knew it was me that coined it until uh, Rolling Stone, they wrote an article about it. But they didn't give me credit, and then all my the people who support me, they were just at Rolling Stone's neck. They were like, "You need to give her credit, give her credit." Mm -hmm. And then everybody, uh, everybody else, you know, tuned in. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, do you have any thoughts about just the connection between like you and your generation, and what you're representing on the internet, and then you know this film and everything that is being represented in, in this time? Well, I feel like um, I, whatever attention that I get on the internet or whatever just 
it brought attention to this in the way that it did. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And you're an archivist, so this yeah. is up your alley. Right, I'm glad this happened. And because this is an education for me too, because I didn't know, I didn't know none of this stuff. When I started, it was just about the aesthetic of it all. Right. All, like music videos and right. photo shoots and stuff like that. But this is a whole other level. And if I can help people my age find out about this stuff. Then yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it is something that is uh, like, about mastery, it is about an aesthetic, it is about style, it is about Western wear, it is about sport, it is about movement. Um, it's all these things, and that's why it's so compelling because y'all represent like so many different things on so many levels. Um, for any of the rodeo riders, any, any of y'all that want to answer, I'm wondering what do you think like some of the solutions are to educating new generations, younger generations about this more? And keeping keeping this alive, this incredible culture and skill that you have, and this this skill this skill set that you've mastered that is so beautiful and is so American and so inspiring, um, and so Black American. What do you have any ideas about that? What you think might be helpful in terms of keeping it going for future generations? Yes, sir. Um... I think, you know, um, encouraging the young black kids and the ones that like horses and, you know, like to be around livestock and stuff like that. Um, be on farms and stuff, you know, just uh, encourage them to, to uh, just start, you know, like they like horses and stuff, to get around people that help them and learn how to ride and participate in different things and stuff like that. Um, I think it's very educational for the young. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I would say it's a good sport now because uh, you can make a good living rodeo. And back in the day, it wasn't a lot of money into it, but now it's a lot of money into it. That's a good sport to get into. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage anybody I see to try it. It's short lifey, but you know, it's money. It's good rodeo. I would just like to say encourage, encouragement for the, the youth, the black, the young, and the old, but mainly the, the young, encourage them. Never let them know that they can't do it because they can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, just put their mind to it, they can do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So speaking of um, how much culture the film represents, all the different levels of the culture. Can you talk a little about the music in the film and how that came together? It has an incredible soundtrack. Sure. Uh, as I was approaching doing this, I mean, my, my background was initially, I used to do movie trailers, you know, the, the coming attractions for movies. And I worked on a lot of movies. And the reason I got interested in the idea of black cowboys was I had been working on things like Superfly and uh, uh, Slaughter and Shaft and Foxy Brown and so I was working on those kinds of movies and I had this I guess commercial thought in my head hey how come there's never been a black western so I started writing one and I never actually got finished doing that because someone came up to me and said hey we just saw a poster somewhere that there's going to be a black rodeo happening on Randall's Island in three or four weeks. And I thought, wow, that's probably better than something I'm going to write. Real live black cowboys, which most people don't know exist. So I went and got together with George Richardson, who was the guy who was organizing it. He was a congressman from New Jersey. And we agreed, and we came and we shot this. And part of my training was don't be boring when you're trying to make a film. Don't let it get too preachy and don't let it you know, have long passages where nothing, nothing's really happening. So I thought the music's got to keep it alive. And so I combed through a lot of mostly R&B music because I thought it fit. And so I found the Unchained My Heart felt good with tying up the cows and <laughs> Slip It and Slide and certainly felt good with the bull riding. And, I didn't know if we could get the rights to these things, but as it turned out, because we were a really low budget documentary, we were able to buy them for a reasonable price and you know, and then 
edit, you know, when you, when you make a documentary, when you're making a, a regular film, you have a composer come in and he composes the music after the fact. But when we're, you're editing a documentary, you kind of want to have the music right there as you're putting it together. So I think that's why, as I was watching it, I was thinking, gee, this stuff fits really well. It doesn't feel like somebody came in after the fact. It feels like it was all chosen to match the music, which it was. So I, I felt like this music represented the culture, and yet it was in contrast with the Western. You know, the, the, the reason that, that I kind of like having that section at the beginning where it's some terrible singer, who happens to be me, singing Home on the Range. Oh, really? you know? <laughs> and I purposely sang it in the kind of, you know, oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. Now, that might be actually insulting to do in Houston, I just realized. <laughs> <laughs> but in New York, it was funny. Uh, but it was to show the contrast between sort of the, the Hollywood-created impression of cowboys and then you get into that cool Sammy Tur Turner music, which is a, a little bit derivative of, of the Shaft theme, the Isaac Hayes, but it drives it so much better than you know, a guy playing the guitar and singing and yodeling, you know, so it, that, that, the music feels like a real character mm -hmm. in the film. The music, the music's amazing. How did Woody Strode and Muhammad Ali get involved? Uh, should I tell the short version or the long version of the story? The, the good, long version. Tell the good version. The good version. Oh, well, I'll, I'll do Woody first. Woody, as you can see, he appeared at the, at the rodeo just as he wanted to be part of it. And he and I didn't actually meet that day other than we just filmed him. And then when I started putting the thing together, I thought, well, we really need someone as a guide to take us through this world because most people don't know about the events and they don't know what's involved and they don't know the history and they don't know the feeling of we were out there too. So I'd really like to have somebody be the spokesperson. So the long version is the first person I showed footage to was Bill Cosby. And he said it was too boring. So he didn't want to do it. And then I thought, who can I get? And then I remembered Woody Strode, Sergeant Rutledge. I'd seen that movie. And he'd probably been in a few other westerns. And he was in Spartacus, where he, he plays the guy that really starts the revolt of the, of the gladiator trainees because he and Kirk Douglas. Does anybody know Spartacus in here? Yeah. Okay, so did you, do you recognize Woody Strode from that? Oh, yeah. yeah, so he seemed like he'd be the perfect guy. I had no idea that he was actually a, sort of a, a, a cowboy himself and very knowledgeable about the whole history. So I had been prepared to write a script for the on-screen narrator so he could take us through the history and the various characters. I didn't have to do that with Woody. He knew it all. So most of what you're seeing up there is him just speaking. He's not reading a script. He's ad-libbing from his own knowledge. It was amazing. Everything, everything he did, it was just right out of his experience and, and his soul. And if it wasn't for that squeaky rocking chair, I'm, I'll never use that rocking chair again. <laughs> So it kind of work, It kind of works, though. I guess so. Yeah, it has that frontier. Feel. Yeah, it has a little frontier feel. <laughs> Otherwise, it, yeah, it would be a problem. But I think in this film, I apologize for that chair. <laughs> and Muhammad Ali. Also, Mama, Muhammad Ali. I was feeling pretty good that that we would have. You know, Woody came in after the fact. The music came in after the fact. But we were filming for, I guess, three days, and I thought it would be great to get something like a celebrity to come down and interact with the cowboy so we could put that on the poster, you know, well, you know, a special guest. And I, I just so happens I had a lawyer at the time who was also a guy named, anybody that knows the boxing business, Robert Aram, anybody know him? He's a big fight promoter now, but then he was a lawyer, and he was Ali's lawyer fighting the, uh, getting him right, the, the right to fight back again because it was stripped away from him when he refused to serve in Vietnam. So I knew this lawyer, and I knew that Ali wasn't able to fight because they had taken away his license. And, and I knew kind of through the grapevine that he was interested in doing things to make a living because he couldn't box. And I asked the lawyer if Ali might come down, and lo and behold, he did. And you know, I'm supposed to be the director of the movie, but in truth, he completely directed himself and we just followed him around with the camera. <laughs> And, you know, there's a, there's a guy you probably didn't notice, but I noticed my brother was one of the sound guys. He's 
guy with a red shirt and long hair, and he's just there looking gaga that he's in the same space as Muhammad Ali the whole time <laughs> holding out the microphone. And I felt the same way. I was just standing there. Oh my God. Oh yeah, I remember that. You know. So, so you know, it was just it was kind of a, I don't know if it was you could say it was luck or fate, uh, but Muhammad Ali came, and the, that just just when the movie started to feel like okay, you know, we get it. That comes in and it wakes everybody up. And he kills it. Yeah, he kills it. <laughs> All right, let's take a, a few audience questions. I know you almost have some questions. Just raise your hand. We have somebody going out with the mic. Any questions? There we go. All right. Yeah, right over there. Really, was his name Muhammad Ali at the time or Cassius Clay? That was one. Because I thought it was Cassius Clay at that time, but no, it, 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 it was he, he had changed it right about the time that he got in trouble with the draft. He had already okay. announced that he was changing his name from Cassius Clay, and there was some. Yeah, that was seventy-one. So that was way after. Yeah. Okay. Seventy-one is. Well, yeah. the, the question he said in the film, it was his first time on a horse. I mean, he did pretty. No, good. no, no. He said it, and then under his breath, he said, "No, nah, I've ridden before." Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, he was, a, yeah. It's from Kentucky, he was, yeah, he was joking. <laughs> okay, we guessed right over here. Thanks. You did ask the question about uh, how could you teach the younger ones, uh, the younger age group uh, today about rodeo and about black rodeo or about any rodeo. In Houston, it's a big thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> rodeo, this is not news to us. Sure, um, of course. And our children <laughs> even know about riding horses, rodeo. But I was surprised, New York. I was like, what? <laughs> I thought it was going to be Texas. Right. But it was New York. Yeah. So that was a surprise to me. And yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, so it, I, it, as you're watching the beginning of the film and you're seeing the people coming out, but even prior to that, the, the parade in the street, I think you feel the, 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 the yeah. Fascination of these people seeing, you know, uh -huh. you know, somebody, somebody representing them doing this thing yeah. that Hollywood made just a white thing, yeah. and uh, I, I think that it didn't turn the film into a hit film, but it never really got exposed. So I think one of the ways you can get young people interested is if they would see something like this and decide they want to try it, and then the second part would be access to horses and and people that could teach them about it, but. It certainly looks like something fun to try as a kid. I, I, mean, I saw the rodeo a couple of times in Madison Square Garden when I was a kid, but I had no access to anything like horses or rodeo, so it's just like it just became a, a little entertainment thing. But if you could, I mean, the guys who were from New Jersey and, and I guess, are you guys from the West or are you from all, all, all from the Houston, Houston area? So, so it's more part of your life down here, right? right. So. You, you have to sort of get people involved, both in their minds and in their the ability to have access to it. But I think you know, to just to their point, like they're talking about getting young people to actually do it. You know, like people know about it, but like getting the next generation to do actually like do this art form, this discipline, this whatever you want to call it. And just I'm glad you brought up what you said because I forgot to say this earlier. I mean, that was really my idea, right? For that's a big part of why I wanted to show this film because it, it really illuminates the influence of places like Houston and how the culture that comes from here spreads around the world and the fact that it was right in New York and there were so many there were so many shout outs to Houston right throughout the film there were so many that's what got me excited that it really it really illuminates how what comes from here influences everywhere and yeah you all know it here but you all are educating the rest of the world right and I think this is a film that really shows that reach that influence that the culture that comes from here has everywhere else. Okay, other, any other questions? Any other questions? Over here? Yes. Sir. So then I, I guess my question would be how do you bridge the gap between the Yeehaw agenda and actual cowboy culture and skills? Like maybe people are watching, um, you know, Old Town Road and it piques their interest, but then how do you bridge the gap into actually learning from? the elders and from the real cowboys and cowgirls. That's for me? Sure. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, like I said, this was a lesson for me too, educational, but K 
kids and people my age, they like visual stuff. So me running that page and having the archives available for everybody to see, I guess just putting on more of the activities that are going on. Like if they have something coming up, just giving them promo. Because that's the hub, you know, for I guess for my generation since they want to call it the e agenda and give me the credit. But yeah, I would love to be the source of that. Like if, you know, they have something going on, let me post about it, let me get somebody who can do some graphics about it, something visual that looks cool, that looks interesting. Yeah, I think most, most things that become fads usually get kicked off by some personality who does it that everybody wants to emulate. So it's your job. No. Well, we okay. could, like, we should try to connect. She's an Everybody influencer. Wants to, yeah. I mean, let's make a connection here so that you can promote some of the, because we have some incredible, you know, organizers and promoters here in the room that are creating these kind of events, and then you have the platform to get the word out. But, sir, also, you know, in response to your question, I think this remains a question. And that's kind of the idea of this discussion. <laughs> this is not a, we're not, you know, I don't think we're going to answer this. And there is this goal between the kind of visual representation and the aesthetic of it, and then the actual like discipline, right? And yeah. I think that's a, I think that will, it's still a question in the air, but it, it is an important question. And I think this discussion and this film raises that question naturally, but I'm not sure we're gonna answer it, but it's something maybe we all can work on. And I think just connecting you guys today is, is something. It's just more of me realizing that it's like my that part of it is my responsibility. Well, it's not on you, Brie, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to, you know, connect the dots, so. As, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking, what's another example of something that nobody, particularly young Americans, did that they now do? And I think soccer. soccer nobody played soccer when I was growing up. Nobody, and it, it seemed like something from another world. Now, Little League soccer and, and now the kids are all doing it, and they're very aware of the World Cup, and and so it, it's it's a certain amount of, of exposure and conditioning that if, if somebody made a concerted effort to make kids aware of it, obviously when you watch the movie, the kids seem pretty fascinated by it, other than wanting to buy this stuff. But they they these large, powerful animals and the speed and especially watching it in slow motion, I mean, it's dangerous and it's scary and it's cool and, and kids would, would want to try it, I think, if their parents would let them. Authentic and experienced, and, li and that's the best way. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm from Dallas as well, so uh, Bree. <laughs> um, and instantly, the first thing I think of is this would be beautiful at the State Fair Classic, uh, the game between Bree and M and Grambling. I mean, I would love to see that happen uh, in North Texas. Um, my question is actually about regionalism. I think the important thing that I get from here is that. Um, we talk about how quick trends are just flipping within this generation and um, how important regionalism really is. I mean, you look at how Black UK has kind of spun and created just this beautiful uh, conversation about uh, the Afro diaspora and um, grime and just so much that's rich within that region. Um, my question to Bree really is with your archive, do you see uh, this particular genre? 
uh, solidifying itself in Texas? Uh, can we put it next to a slab or, you know, can we put it next to uh, Bumby and UGK and say, you know, this is something that the boots, the, the hat, everything is something that is boldly us. Um, I'm, you know, just catching so much inspiration from when I get home, the movie, and today, and just wanting to see if this is something that we could definitely say, yeah, this is, it's Texas. Well, I feel like it already is Texas. Um, and that's why when I started getting all these people want to interview me and stuff, I was so, like, shook because I thought, you know, I see this all the time. Like, people were acting like they never seen, like, even a picture of somebody. And it's been like, Texas. Right, and it's, it's been Texas. Yeah. So whenever somebody asks me this question, I always cite, like, Texas artists. And Mary J. Blige, too. Um, but I always thought like Destiny's Child, Solange, you know, uh, UGK. So I don't know, I guess just turning it more into a Texas thing. I used to have that in my bio too, because the location was Texas, because someone else was doing something similar yeah. that wasn't in Texas. It was really weird. Well, I would see so much, oh, sorry. <laughs> I would see so much in like uh, Sam Lambert, Luke Saab, and, like all these guys are wearing boots and the hats, and I'm like, well, this is us. I mean, yeah, this you is know. our thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I already, I think that already is our thing. I guess just being more vocal about it. Like we started this. Of course, like Megan Thee Stallion, artists that are popping now, like they really rep Texas. So I think you know, the coming the next few years, people are gonna know that's Texas, and then I'm from Texas, so the agenda is Texas. Let's see if there's. We have one more. Okay, over here in the front. We'll take one last question. I have a question for the black uh, cowboys and cowgirl. How do you guys feel about the reemergence of the whole cowboy aesthetic that has come from the as she said, Megan the Stallion? Like she reps Houston real hard. Um, she even went right with the Compton cowboy. Good Cowboys. question. Um, and Little Nas X, even though I don't think he's from Texas, but I think he is from somewhere in the South. Georgia, area. Atlanta. Right. You see all these artists from the southern regions and even up to the Carolinas. They're all embracing the look, and now I just want to know how do you guys feel about it? If you even look into that, if you look into that stuff nowadays. You know, <laughs> excuse me. Um, it's a lot of black cowboys all over the world. And um, people, you know, nowadays are in different parts of the country, they, they start to pull together with trail rides and putting on different shows and having rodeos and little arts and ends to kind of, you know, influence the kids to, you know, to, to kind of follow them, you know, and grow up in the situation so they way they would have something to do as they grow up. And cowboying is something that all kids are like to be anyway, um, even in Texas. So it goes from here on up. And, um, and I think it would, uh, you know, be nice that everybody encourage all the kids to just kind of follow the cowboys. I just had an idea. But it's probably a bad idea, but I'll just say it. And if it's dumb, you can all walk, walk out. So you got the Dallas Cowboys. And I think they're doing pretty well this year, right? So let's say the Dallas Cowboys get into the Super Bowl. Why not get to influence somebody that the halftime show, instead of being some disappointing rock and roll show, do something connected to Cowboys and rodeo, have a demonstration at halftime show at the Super Bowl of, of bronc riding and, and I mean, it sounds ridiculous as I'm saying. It actually might already be in the works. So. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you know, the way things are going, yeah. it might be a anyway, like, just little Nas X. Everybody get together and yeah. demand a rodeo exhibition at the halftime of the Super Bowl. Okay, good. Uh, Lucretia, you were gonna say something, could you? I was yeah. gonna have her repeat her question. I didn't fully yeah. understand. Okay, yes, I'm please sorry. repeat your question. Do you, can you hear me from Yes. Me? Yeah, we, yeah. Okay. My question was, how did you guys feel about the reemergence of this image appearing nowadays in pop culture from like a bunch of different artists like Megan Thee Stallion, Lil Nas X, who
who specifically originate from Southern and regions where that was uh, born. Um, that was my question. Like, how do you guys feel about it appearing up and again now? The image of the cowboy, how popular it is right now with so young black people. Cowboys yeah, black cowboys specifically. Thank you. The way I feel, the image of a black cowboy today is, it's not as different from what it was back in the past. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the same. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that's a good note to end on. <laughs> the continuity of it all. Thank you all. Jeff, you should share your. Jeff has a photo he wants to. No, you <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> okay, I, you guys want to see what Jeff looked I, like I, when yeah, he made yeah, this movie, right? I, I brought this. Yeah. I mean, I, also, I, he directed Revenge of the Nerds. Just FYI. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, when I knew I was coming down here, I was going to have to answer questions or something. I thought, well, again, like how to try, try to a keep from being boring, and b. Uh, <laughs> I, when I realized how long ago Black Rodeo happened and how long ago we made the film, I thought, what did I look like then? <laughs> and I, want, I want those sideburns back. Yeah, speaking of continuity, thank you everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, panel.